Hello everybody, welcome to more Chainsaws Needed, where, because I love horror, thrillers and suspense, I am going to talk, rant, rave about, review and recommend movies, TV series and books in those genres for you guys as I draw. Last time, we talked about my absolute favorite monster, the zombie, but I barely touched on a so-called new variant of the same, the rage zombie or more precisely, the rage-infected human being who loses all coherent thought and starts behaving like a rampaging zombie. But let's be honest. Yes, that is a little bit of a mouthful for a description. The actual name most people use is the infected, but that one also is a bit unclear since there are... I am trying to explain that. Yes. Since there are other horror monsters that can be considered... Yes, hey, hey. Uh huh. They can be considered infected because it is an infection because you get it from someone else. Like, for example, vampires and werewolves because, you know, let's not go into that rabbit hole right now, okay? It's a little bit complicated already. If you Google Rage Virus or even first movie about a rage virus, you will probably get 2002 Danny Boyle's 28 Days Later. If you Google first movie about a virus making people crazy, you will get um, Contagion. But I blame that one on the current place that makes people crazy without, you know, being crazy being an actual symptom of the disease. However, while 28 Days Later is certainly memorable and one of those movies I will love to revisit one day, the truth is that the original Rage Infected came from the same place that we got our modern zombies the horror legend, the zombie grandmaster, George Romero. And to make a good companion to our last video, keep those chainsaws handy because today we are facing two movies for the price of one, The Crisis from 1973 and its very good remake from 2010. After Night of the Living Dead, George Romero found himself in a bit of a slump. His very first movie after it, There's Always Vanilla, was... A romantic comedy. No horror there, only fluff and romance and carefree people because, well, sometimes you need a breather. But of course, that one had no feet and no real success in the box office. Season of the Witch, also known as Jack's Wife, also known as Hungry Wives, was a bit more of a horror story with a woman turning to witchcraft due to her boredom with being a housewife. It was weird. And while Romero described it as a feminist film, it is also one that doesn't have a really good footing plot-wise. Then came The Crisis, which was a little like returning to the genre that had made him famous because while The Crisis, also known as Codename Trixie, which, let's be honest, is the most hilarious name for a movie ever after Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter, has some very noticeable common plots with Night of the Living Dead. The very first one, well, it is horror. And once again, paranoia has more to do with the actual deaths than the issue at hand. The movie was not very well received originally, but it was mostly because it had a very, very, very limited release. The fact that it was also released with different names in different places didn't help much. However, those who saw it were quite impressed by both the cinematography and the story itself. Unlike the accidental social message from Knight, this time Romero was quite aware of what he was saying. While he wanted to be more focused on the survivors of the situation, the producer, who had also given the money for There's Always Vanilla, insisted that Romero needed to rewrite the script to make it more about the military takeover of the town. Oh yeah, there is a military takeover an immortal virus that no one knows how it works, and people going insane. And I think it's believe it's time I told you what the crisis is about before you confuse this with the evening news. The town of Evans City, Pennsylvania, wakes up with a bang when a man kills his wife and burns down his farmhouse with his children inside. Among the firefighters called to the scene, David happens to have a pregnant girlfriend, Judy, who is also a nurse, who is called to Dr. Brockmeyer's office, the closest they have in town to a hospital, in order to treat the kids who thankfully survived, for a little bit. 
But when Judy arrives to the office, she finds out that it has been taken over by soldiers. And soon, the whole town is in quarantine because days before, a plane with a bioweapon had crash-landed near it and infected the whole water supply. And as the soldiers try to keep the people contained, more and more of the town inhabitants fall ill by becoming homicidally insane. At the same time, David, Judy, their friend Clank, a teenager named Cathy and her father Archie, try to escape town before they too fall sick. The very interesting thing about the crisis, and probably why it didn't get so much traction originally, is that there are no bad guys. We focus a lot on the soldiers quarantining the town, and we know that they don't know what the hell is going on, and they really want to protect the people in the town, even with the little information they have from the superiors. Yes, they look very menacing in their protective suits with the gas masks, but they are not evil. On the other hand, the group of survivors, David and company, are also not evil. They are afraid, they have no idea what's going on, and once the virus starts taking hold of them, they do some very horrible things, including Artie trying at some point to abuse his daughter, who is thankfully not acted by a real teenager, in front of Crank, while ranting that Crank is not good enough or, or young enough to date her. Yeah, that scene is really uncomfortable. The closest we have to a villain is the pencil pusher who proposes that they have to bomb the town before Trixie gets out of the containment, and even then he is working with limited information because due to a lot of miscommunication, no one knows what is really going on. And in the end, that's what kills pretty much 99% of our cast. Fear miscommunication, lack of information, and, well, just the virus. There are a couple of people who actually die from the virus. But honestly, those are very few. Uh, the, the deaths caused by the virus or by the people infected are quite minimal. The real problem is that everyone is acting with the best intentions without really knowing what the hell is going on which only helps to make the tragedy bigger as the ones who do know what's going on start dying at the hands of those who don't know what the hell is going on. Which, to be honest, is quite realistic, but not very good for a horror movie as we don't have anyone to hate. Which was not quite the case for the 2010 remake. The main story of The Crisis 2010 is pretty much the same on the townspeople's part. Well, I mean, as far as the beginning goes. Sure, the name of the town is changed from Evan City to Owen Marsh, and our main character David is now the town's sheriff instead of one of the town's firemen, and his girlfriend Judy is now his wife and the town's doctors instead of just a nurse. But other than that, it's a tiny little town that one day wakes up to have some people acting strange. Yes, uh, we do get to see the town a little bit more before the first house goes in flames, which is literally the first scene of the original movie. And And we get to see that the town is a night-tight community where everyone knows everyone. And that when things start going weird, during the opening day of school baseball season, to add insult to injury in my opinion, everyone is concerned about their neighbors rather than about themselves. After the sheriff is forced to shoot a man who came into the game with a shotgun and refused to let it go, another man sets his house on fire, this is the first scene of the original, with his wife and child inside. This time, the child does not survive the fire. And the sheriff and his deputy discover that a plane came down in the town's water supply. Same as before. And before they can do anything about that, Things go from bad to worse as first communications are completely cut, which, when you have cell phones, is quite scary, and the army literally invades the town and puts everyone in quarantine, separating Judy and David as she presents a fever, more than likely due to her pregnancy and not because she's sick. And here is where the crisis 2010 really diverged from the crisis 1978. Because once you have David and Judy separated, we don't get to see any of the military's point of view. We are as blind as David as to their intentions and motivations. 
Are they trying to cure the ill? Are they trying to help those who aren't sick yet? We don't know. The town doesn't know. And because of this, everyone is panicking and making things even worse. So yeah, this one has the military as literal faceless smokes. We only get to see one and two without their gas masks and only for a few seconds, who just yell orders expecting to be obeyed without any resistance or questions. They just shoot those who are sick, no matter their ages or if they actually show any symptoms, and at some point, someone decides that the best course of action is a literal kill it with fire, or, well, as it is 2010, kill it with nukes. At some small point, we are told that, just like the townspeople, the soldiers are not really told what's going on. They were actually told that the everyone in town was infected, dangerous, and had to be terminated with extreme prejudice at the point that if they were not wearing their masks, they would also die. But they were never told what caused the infection, or not that about 80% of the infected would just die without going insane. But this is such a short scene, and later the military acts with such violence, that it's quite hard to remember that they were as ignorant as the townspeople. And just in case that the military faceless smokes are not good enough of a villain for the audiences, they remake up the ante in the events with the infected. In the original, we only saw the military face them. And out of our main group of survivors, the effects of the virus are creepy as hell, but not really dangerous to others, with the exception of the father who tries to abuse his daughter, but thankfully he's stopping in time. But the remake takes it up 100% but le- by letting more infected run free from the family of the first victim who hyperfixiates in getting revenge of David for killing their loved one to a group of hunters who decide that it's a great idea to start eating those who cross their path and make a remake of the world's most dangerous game. And well, we, and David, and all the survivors know that it's not really the infected's fault, we are still glad that they do not survive long enough to see the towns getting nuked, at the same time that we understand how bad things would go if the virus crossed the town's limits. There are many aesthetical changes between the original and the remake, but curiously, the end result is quite similar. Here is where I beg you to watch both if you haven't yet, since I'm going to go into big spoilers for the end. The Crisis 1978 is fully available in YouTube for free of all places, and as far as I know, uh, and I could find out, it has a similar situation to Night of the Living Dead regarding the copyright, so it's legal. While 2010 is both on Netflix and HBO Max, at the very least, so you can find it easily. Seriously. Pause my video, watch the movies, see you in four hours. Well, maybe five. You will need a drink after those two. First things first. As I keep hammering on, there is no overarching billion in either of the movies. While yes, we can argue that the military are the bad guys for creating the Trixie virus in the first place, In the first movie, we are told that everyone in the military thought that the virus didn't work, that it was innocuous, and in fact, it's the thing that cements that there is no communication between anyone at all, since the head scientist replies with, innocuous according to your set standards, which means that, nope, scientists never said that the virus was safe. And in the second one, the plane was heading to destroy the virus? Meaning, yeah, it was a bad idea. Meaning that they didn't want to use it at all. What happened was an accident, and while sure, everyone in power should have dealt with the situation differently, there was no ill intent on any part. Which makes it more of a tragedy, of course. And, well, that is why we have a story. Yes, hey, hey. David, in both versions, is 100% convinced that the military is to blame, and in the original, this is what makes him keep quiet about his possible immunity to Trixie, but again, he has no idea that the horrible treatment to his town and loved ones was not down out of malice, nor that they had been trying to avoid killing everyone, 
and it had been just the panic setting in what caused about 90% of the death. In fact, had he not escaped quarantine, maybe Jody and Russell would still be alive at the end. But let's not tell him that right now because it's going to make things worse. Um, second, in both versions, panic is far more dangerous than the virus itself. Although this is a bit muddied in the second one because the second one has various scenes of dangerous infected to create more tensions. Besides her opening pyromaniac, because the town drunk really didn't do anything except looking menacing and interrupting a baseball game. Okay, yes, for that he has to die. Um, we also have the local corner sewing people up while they are still alive. The town's principal killing people in garnies because they make noise. The town's strong family trying to kill David and Jody in revenge. And of course, our resident cannibal hillbilly hunters because we always have to have resident cannibal hillbilly hunters. The first movie, on the other hand, has only the pyromaniac, a crazy granny with deadly knitting needles, a priest who immolates himself and thus harms no one else, and Katie's father who... Yeah, well, he's not as crazy, but he surely wins the prize for the creepiest tricks he infected. Again, I am so glad that Katie is not acted by a teenager. But really, the worst casualties happens when people panic and fight the soldiers. In fact, that is how the person with the cure dies and the cure gets destroyed by accident. And more importantly, in the original, you can't tell if they are infected or not. Because there, there was no way to distinguish between infected people and shell-shocked one, or when paranoia made them think that everyone else was infected, which is what led the military to literally kill everyone in town. And that brings us to Russell Clank, which um, happens to be my favorite character of both movies. In the original, Clank is David's best friend from Vietnam, and he gets trigger happy quite early. But it isn't until Archie's, Cathy's father, kills himself, when David and Jody start suspecting him from being inspected, as he keeps insisting that he didn't kill Archie, even if he had been just even if he would have been so justified, since well, Archie had just tried to rape his own daughter in front of him. But after that, he becomes slower in reacting to escape, especially after Cathy dies, and seems more interested in fighting than in fleeing. However, David is a Vietnam veteran who is probably reliving the worst days of combat as he is chased by the hazmat suit wearing soldiers. He decides that he has the bug, no evidence needed, and then stays behind to keep the soldiers distracted and away from David and Jody. To be honest, in that scene, he's probably the one individual with the biggest kill count in the whole movie, and we don't know if he is really infected. Because while Jess, at first he does talk to an invisible David, once he's in combat, he acts quite rationally, killing the enemies methodically and efficiently in a way that no other infected had done in the whole movie. In the remake, Russell declares that he will succumb to the virus fairly early, as he points out to David that his house is closer to the infected water supply than David's. However, from that point on, he happens to be the most reliable ally that Jody and David have in town. Yes. At some point, he uses more force than what is apparently necessary. But once you stop to think about it, the fact that he shot the infected who attacked David at his home more than once, that is supposedly our first clue that he is infected, he also explains in the, in the same moment that he was making sure which, to be fair, is the right thing to do in the situation. Double tap, people. Double tap. And later on, when Jody and David are afraid of him, when he refuses to give up his weapons, he still doesn't attack them, even if Jody and David are being openly hostile to him. And he points out that at that moment, he had saved David's life three times already. It wasn't until he kills an unarmed man specifically one of the generals who had caused the whole problem, when he decides that he must be infected, and in a heartbreaking sequence, 
first asks David and Jody to walk with them for a while, and later sacrifices his life to save them. Again, by distracting the military, by going directly to the part where they are uh, stopping everybody in town and making them shoot him. Which could be proof that he wasn't infected as he was pretty calculating and aware of his actions just as his original counterpart was. And it is even worse because in the remake we have pretty clear visual clues of who is infected and who isn't, especially in the later stage. Most obviously, uh, the infected get black veins in their neck. And Russell never gets them. Yes, he looks tired. Yes, he looks haggard. But uh, he had been running for his life for at least 24 hours. So it's very ambiguous if he was really infected or just panicking and thinking he was. And that is important because both Russell Clank and Clank prove that in any situation, the real killer is panic. Followed quite closely by lack of information and communication. If Night of the Living Dead was George Romero stumbling onto horror social commentary by accident, the original crisis was him doing it on purpose and with clinical precision. It's not just government bad, but people bad when scared. And that is a lesson we should definitely not forget, especially nowadays. I will be 100% honest. Watching the soldiers enforce the quarantine, in particular in the original, made me think if the real problem right now is not that. That is what people who are against quarantine and vaccines are seeing in their heads when we ask for common sense protective measures such as wear a mask outside and don't cough on people. So watch them both if you haven't yet, please do so. And consider long and hard that, well, the way Trixie works is very exaggerated. And as far as I know, we never have had a military enforced quarantine like the ones we see in both movies anywhere in the world. Panic does work that way. And it can be even more deadly than what we see here. I want to thank my dear patrons, Mitch Hyman, Elaine Ho, and Jessic, as well as my first supporter, Tanya Pineda, and the most amazing woman in the universe, Amy Sunk, without whom none of my videos would be possible. I also want to remind you that if you want to support these and my other projects and get your name mentioned here, you can do so at patreon.com slash Adelisa, with a link in the description as I know my name can be hard to spell, and with just one USD a month, you will always be thanking in my videos, as well as get access to a ton of art before anyone else and get the chance to suggest future subjects for videos. You can also support me on coffee, and with one cup of coffee, you get mentioned in one video. If you can't support me this way, I also accept likes, subscriptions to the channel, comments so that the algorithm catches engagement, and of course, you sharing the links. And please, all your questions, feedbacks, and suggestions in the comments below, because I swear I read them all. This was Adalisa Sarate, and remember, there is not a problem in the horror genre that cannot be solved with more chainsaws.